Now I'm so excited to introduce our two speakers. Juanita Shearer Swink, ASLA Fellow, PLA, is a practitioner member of the Landscape Architectural Accreditation Board and recently retired in May 2019 from Go Triangle, where she was most recently the Architectural Program Manager for the Durham Orange Light Rail Transit Project. During her 27 years at Go Triangle, a regional public transit agency in the Triangle region of North Carolina, she was involved in the community engagement, public policy, intergovernmental initiatives, planning and design of transit and rail projects and the placemaking they facilitate. As a registered landscape architect, she has practiced primarily in the public sector in the Triangle region and in Miami, Florida, including 11 years with the city of Miami as a capital projects manager and landscape architect. She participates as a mentor and visiting lecturer in the North Carolina State University College of Design Landscape Architecture Department. Throughout her 45 year career, Juanita has worked on numerous state chapter and national ASLA committees and initiatives, including the ASLA Diversity Summits for which she served as a facilitator from 2012 to 2016. Christopher Pritchard is the Accreditation and Education Director at the American Society of Landscape Architects. His main responsibility is managing the Landscape Architectural Accreditation Board, LAAB, the accrediting organization for professional landscape architecture degree programs. LAAB's mission is to evaluate, advocate for, and advance the quality of education in professional landscape architecture degree programs. As such, LAAB's main focus over the last year has been revising the LAAB accreditation standards specifically focusing on the curriculum and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today, they're presenting their talk on diversity, equity, and inclusion in LAAB accreditation standards. Welcome, Juanita and Christopher. Thank you, Eileen. While I'm pulling up the slides, uh, great introduction, and it probably eliminates a few of our slides, which is great. Um, yes, I was going to say that that takes out at least a couple slides I had to say because now I don't need to talk about that, which is great. So again, good morning uh, and thank you for joining us for today for diversity, equity, inclusion in the LAAB accreditation standards. Like Eileen said, my name is Chris Pritchard, uh, the accreditation and education director at ASLA National. My pronouns are he, him. And while many of you are joining virtually from all over the United States, I wanted to take a brief moment to acknowledge that I and ASLA's headquarters are on the unceded land of the Piscataway people. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Piscataway, Piscataway community and the communities of which you are located, their elders, both past and present, as well as their future generations. I find an acknowledgement statement to be important for this profession as stewards of the land. And I actually first truly understood this concept during a presentation last year uh, during Land Aid's Juneteenth uh, Day event with Kofi Boone, uh, who gave an incredible opening keynote last night. So thank you, uh, Cornell and Labash. I also wanted to acknowledge and recognize that you all uh, students uh, listening in have gone through an incredible, and I hate to say unprecedented, but it is a uh, year and uh, the extra burden that you've had uh, not being able to connect with your classmates and uh, fellow teachers uh, and uh, with the pandemic, it might have impacted many of your families and also uh, the racial injustice that's been taking place uh, over the last year and far beyond that. Uh, and just say that, you know, I want you all to know that you're not only coming out of this with a degree, uh, but you're going to have unimaginable skills to incorporate uh, in your future as a professional. So I have a couple polls to try and wake you up this morning. Um, the first one, do you know who LAAB is or what they do? Let's go ahead and answer that. You sure this, that, that's not a trick question, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Eight, eight more seconds here. Okay, so about 60% of you do and 40% don't. So hopefully the 40%, uh, oops, let me share the results so you can see that. Uh, hopefully the 40% of you that don't will know better at the end of this presentation. Um, 
So just to kind of give you some context, you might have heard some of these other organizations. Uh, this group on the screen here makes up what's called the President's Council, which you might have heard as, as well. And you could see uh, in the different organizations, there's a word that's highlighted or a different color. And that really gives you context of what those organizations do and how we all fit in together with each other. Uh, LAAB at the top there is the accreditation board. And we'll talk a little bit about accreditation in a minute. Uh, you probably heard of CELA, maybe even attended the CELA conference, uh, and that's the Council of Educators. So that's a group that supports and uh, further educates and faculty at your programs. I'm sure many of you have heard and are maybe even hopefully members of the American Society of Landscape Architect. That's the professional society. That's really the all-encompassing bringing us all together and our uh, sister Society, the Canadian Society uh, to the north of us here, similar idea, but it's the Canadian Society. And then we had the Landscape Architecture Foundation. If you think about the foundation of the profession, their focus is on research and scholarship and leadership. Uh, and then last but certainly not least is CLARB, the Council of Landscape Architectural Registration Board. So when you're thinking about licensure and who oversees that process, that's CLARB. So you can see how they all fit. Uh, and just a plug, uh, there's going to be a uh, session later on Earth Day, later this month on Earth Day, Thursday, uh, April 22nd at 6 p.m., where all these organizations are coming together to talk to you as students a little bit more about how we support you now uh, as students and in the future as professionals. So again, LAAB uh, is the accrediting organization for landscape architecture degree programs. Uh, we work to evaluate advocate for and advance the quality of education in the professional landscape architecture degree program. Some of you might not know what accreditation is. Uh, as an undergrad education major myself, going on to become a math teacher, uh, I did not hear once in the four years I studied to be an educator what accreditation was, uh, but I quickly learned as a math teacher when my high school was getting an accreditation visit and for a week long, this outside team came with clipboards and was asking questions and interviewing people and talking to students and teachers and leaders and even looking at uh, outlet plugs and safety and fire extinguishers. And what turned out that accreditation is an outside organization that evaluates your school or program to determine that it's meeting minimally uh, <laughs> minimal standards of excellence. Uh, so you're getting a quality education. So who knew? I just thought and assumed that universities were just kind of always doing the right thing, but it turns out there's an outside body that sort of forces them to. And that's what LAAB is for landscape architecture programs, both undergrad and graduate. The board itself is made up of educators, practitioners, public members, and representatives from some of our sister organizations that we just mentioned, ASLA, the Society, CELA, the Group with Educators, and CLARB, uh, the licensure group. Uh, so there's representatives from each of them. And then educators are faculty that are from your uh, programs out there across the US. Uh, practitioners uh, like um, our, our landscape architects uh, who have worked in the public or private sector uh, for a number of years and is bringing that experience to determine that the students uh, are being prepared to go out and be practitioners themselves. And then public members actually are not landscape architects. They're not affiliated with any of our programs. And they are simply uh, serving as public members from a variety of backgrounds to ensure that a bunch of landscape architects aren't getting together and just rubber stamping and approving all the programs out there. Uh, they also bring their different backgrounds to enrich the board and its experience. And I'm lucky enough today to have one of our board members, one of our pub, uh, practitioner board members, uh, Juanita Shear Swink uh, joined me for this talk this morning to give a little bit of a pra practitioner's perspective and board member's perspective. Welcome, Juanita. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, since you all heard the introduction, I need not go through a whole lot on these slides. But, but in terms of my volunteer activities, I think for me, the most significant one was in 2011 and 2012, ASLA um, began to look at what was happening um, to our profession, and it was clear that the profession was not, and the graduates of our universities were not um, representative of the future population to whom we would serve. And that's why they initiated the uh, diversity summits, which I had the pleasure of facilitating 
for five years. And that photograph is a group of our summiteers. For the first five years, they were a mixture of uh, Latinx and African-American and people of color. Um, and we rotated a group out every year. It was a wonderful experience. And that group of people has gone on to take on leadership roles in ASLA next. Next. Um, my day jobs uh, included a variety of different things. Perhaps uh, one rather significant one was the, uh, which was an appointment. The, the governor of North Carolina at the time appointed me to the uh, North Carolina Board of Transportation. I ended up serving for two years. Um, it was, I am, I was the first and perhaps only for a long time landscape architect on that board. And it was a fascinating experience because the DOT here uh, touches on every single county and builds roads and communities as well as highways. Um, as you heard in my introduction, um, I have spent most of my career in public practice working on capital project management uh, and other activities all of which included community engagement. Um, in the Miami area, one of the things that I did in terms of managing consultants was to work on Bayside and Bayfront Park. And when I was at Land Design, one of the projects that we worked on was the um, Centennial Campus, which has evolved and is quite wonderful over time. Next. All right, here's our next set of poll questions. And thanks, uh, Juanita, uh, and welcome. And thanks for being with us this morning to help uh, me get through this talk. It's much more interesting having you than just me talking for an hour. <laughs> All right, so the next question. Did an accreditation visit take place while you've been a student, either this year or in previous years? Go about four more seconds. Okay. So almost half, uh, so 44% of you uh, have had an accreditation visit and 56% have not. And for those of you that did have an accreditation visit, you're 44% out there, uh, were you involved in the accreditation visit when it took place? <clears throat> okay. So thirty three percent were involved and sixty seven percent were not. Okay. So for those of you that were involved, if you're willing to share in the chat uh, how you were involved in the accreditation visit when it took place, uh, we'd love to hear just how you engaged in the process. Uh, so LAAB uh, currently accredits 47 undergraduate and 53 graduate programs across the US, uh, across 73 institutions total. Um, one of the things that is expected of programs is that they sub are required to submit an annual report uh, collected by LAAB uh, every summer of each year. And this is the most accurate data regarding academic programs for landscape architecture. And since 2013, we've collected data from 100% of the accredited programs. They give us data like enrollment count for undergraduate and graduate students, looking at demographics like gender, domestic versus international students, and even giving us data so that we can compare landscape architecture enrollment to other programs like architecture and planning. Uh, all of this is publicly available by year in aggregate form. Uh, if you go to asla.org slash LAAB news, this is the link that's on the slide there. Uh, it's all available publicly and you could look at the different information that's out there. Not only do we collect this from the programs, but we publish the data each year to let the public know and, and particularly our institutions and programs and, and other interested members uh, what that data looks like and what it tells us for the future of the profession. And then we also share the data with the President's Council organizations that I uh, showed you a few slides ago and that uh, helps all of the organizations collectively look at um, what the profession the future of the profession looks like, what the current state of the profession, the health of the profession right now looks like so that uh, the those organizations and the profession at large uh, can be better prepared for 
uh, and be uh, more uh, proactive rather than reactive in some of these areas. And Juanita is going to talk to us a little bit about the accreditation process itself. So for those of you who did not participate um, in an accreditation visit when you were in your programs, or, and you still are certainly, the first piece, um, the first thing that happens is um, a, three people are selected to be the evaluators, um, usually a dean, an academic administrator, um, an educator, such as a department chair um, or head, and a landscape architecture practitioner, perhaps in the public or private sectors. The program itself prepares a self-evaluation report or SER. There's an image of the cover of one of them. Um, and it's a fairly extensive document that responds to the various standards that Chris is going to talk about. It's essentially telling us um, how things have, have been working and how the program is evolving. The team reviews the SER in preparation for their visit. They visit the program and uh, they meet with the administrators, the program chairs, faculty and students. And they also take a look at the facilities. Uh, what kind of computer facilities are there? What's the, what are the studios like? What's the library like? Is it in fact sustaining a, vi a good educational context for you? The visiting team then uh, prepares a report and that's what LAAB uses um, in their decision-making, in their process to determine um, how the program will move forward. Normally, accreditation takes place every six years, and so a decision to retain accreditation would be six years. I think that's all, right? Thank you. And our next poll question. Are you familiar with the LAAB accreditation standards? So what Juanita and I talked to you about so far was who is LAAB. Uh, now we're gonna get into a little bit of what the standards are so that you can start to see uh, how we've revised them over the last year and a half and where we're going with them in the next year uh, and how we plan to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, throughout that process. And Chris, while we're waiting, one of the students in the, in, in the uh, chat indicated that 5% of their grade um, was based on them uploading their uh, projects for the SER. So some Very people got really involved apparently. So it looks like most of you are not familiar with the standards. So hopefully by the end of this, if we ask this question, uh, that would be a different result. So there's two documents um, and LA, uh, the accreditation standards and the and the procedures and the standards are really what uh, we're going to focus on today. Uh, to do its mission, LAAB creates and applies accreditation standards, which uh, LAAB develops with input from the community of interest. And LAAB's community of interest in includes the landscape architecture programs, you all as students, uh, your program chairs and faculty, ASLA and its members, CELA, CLARB, LAF, the higher education community at large, and even the public. Um, the standards are the essential conditions which a professional program in landscape architecture must meet to achieve, to achieve and maintain accreditation. And LAAB regularly reviews and assesses these standards and revises them to ensure that they remain relevant uh, to the profession. And just to give you an overview of what those standards look like, there are seven standards. Uh, the beginning part is kind of the framework of what a program uh, is, is, is structured, both its mission and objectives, its autonomy, its administration, how it's governed. And then the meat of the program, the curriculum, what is taught, what is expected to be taught, what students should know when they're graduating from a program, and what are those outcomes look like. And then, and the faculty, you know, who's teaching the programs and, uh, and what are their qualifications and how many is appropriate for the number of students that you have in your school. And then the last two standards are really about <clears throat> um, pulling the program together, you know, going beyond that curriculum. How does the program interact with the entire institution, uh, the community outside of the institution, alumni and practitioners that uh, alumni, you know, getting feedback on how the program helped prepare them when they graduate and practitioners, firms and other organizations out there that are hiring graduates. Uh, again, engaging with them, getting feedback so that they know that the their students are being, the program students are being well prepared. 
And then finally, but not uh, least, cer certainly not least, is the facilities, equipment, technology that you're all being trained about uh, so that you are prepared, you're learning, you're learning the information and you're being prepared uh, to work out in the field. And when you go to each of those standards, you'll see there's even substandards within them. Um, so when you're looking at things like the curriculum, uh, beyond just the curriculum itself, what do, what do the syllabi need to have? How's the curriculum evaluated? Does the program provide augmentation of, of its education experience beyond just the formal curriculum? Uh, the coursework that's expected, those sorts of things. And so these standards are really used uh, as a baseline to compare programs across the country evenly and consistently. Uh, when you look into the standards, you'll see that the way that they're developed and especially the revisions that we're working on now is really uh, understanding that every program is a little different uh, based on the faculty they have, where they're located, the focus of study. Uh, but these standards are developed enough so that all the in, uh, programs across the country, while still being able to maintain their uniqueness, uh, shows that they meet uh, a minimum standard uh, that's expected or needed to be exceeded. Um, and they demonstrate that through a self-evaluation report that Winita just talked about. And then just to give you a sense of how the standards are set up, um, standard one, program and mission, there's an overall statement at the beginning, which talks about that the mission should be supported by goals and uh, include core values under the standards and that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and then there's the substandards underneath. So the program's mission, again, another statement, and then assessments under that, that really not only prompts the program to get a sense of what's expected, but also provides the team some guidance of what they should be expecting to see from the programs. And so you see, as you go through each of the seven standards, there's a number of these substandards and assessments under them. So as I mentioned, we do go through a process where we revise the entire standards at least once every five years. Uh, and we started this latest round of revisions in summer of 2019. Uh, so we kicked off the process back in the summer of 2019, created a review committee, the standards review committee uh, that was going to include some board members, but have some outside members to, to provide some input. Uh, in the fall of 2019, and also in the winter and spring of 2020, uh, the committee reviewed and made recommendations. Uh, also, there were public comment periods where folks could provide input, whether it was the organizations themselves or members or faculty or students, uh, whoever had some input of what they wanted to see or see removed um, or be edited or changed uh, would engage in the process and give the board some feedback. So in the summer of 2020, uh, the committee's revisions were incorporated based on those public comments. And then in the fall, uh, this past fall, uh, those revisions were adopted and published in this January. <clears throat> but as you'll hear in the uh, later in the presentation, uh, the board did continue to revise standards around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So before we get into what those revisions were that were published, uh, we have one more, uh, at least one more poll. We have a couple more actually. <laughs> oh, no, wait. Yeah, so did, were any of you engaged in this last revision process that took place between fall of 2019 and spring of 2020? All right, looking at the results, Juanita, we have a lot of work to do. That's true, although in the chat, I got a note that said that uh, one of the people actually participated in the uh, town hall and we wanted to know if there was option for them to do that in the future. So stay tuned because there is. Awesome. Yeah, so 100% said they were not engaged in this last uh, revisions process. So hopefully that changes in this upcoming one. Um, so just quickly to show you some of the revisions that were published in January. And then we'll dive into after this um, some of the revisions that we're working on now to continue to improve the standards. Um, so program disclosure, these are requirements that programs need to include publicly on their website. Um, there's a whole list of things that we require, including um, tuition and fees and things like that. And one of the things that we added was estimated cost of an attendance 
But beyond that, any policies, initiatives, and programs in place to reduce the cost of attendance. We wanted programs to start to put that information out there so the prospective students can start to compare the different programs and see which one might be best to support their financial needs. In addition to that, uh, we already had a diversity standard, uh, but it was just about diversity. And so we wanted to expand that to include equity and inclusion. We did require uh, that programs show concrete um, steps to how they're meeting that standard. Uh, but even through this process, we got a lot of great feedback and engagement that encouraged us to, uh, beyond the events that happened last summer, to continue to look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are we expecting of programs? What were um, benchmarks that programs should be looking to meet or exceed? So we knew that we had additional work uh, that needed to be done in that area. Uh, in the curriculum, the list of things that are required, we require that diversity, equity, and inclusion be uh, thought of when you're thinking about history and looking at principles and values. Um, we added interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, knowing that you're going to uh, often be on teams, interdisciplinary teams, and work with different professions in different communities. And then also in, beyond plant and ecosystem sciences, we wanted to make sure while many programs are out there focusing on climate and climate science, uh, we wanted to make sure that programs see that it is it should be expected within landscape architecture programs. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, a, a kind of overarching assessment, which is that the program itself identifies and engages in contemporary environmental, public policy, social justice, and design issues that landscape architects are positioned uh, to address. And then we also wanted to make sure we got a lot of feedback of concern that students might not be getting uh, prepared adequately for licensure expectations and the path to licensure. So we wanted to start to weave throughout the accreditation standards that the program is preparing students so that they're at least prepared to meet licensure requirements. Not to say every student needs to go on and be licensed, but at the very least, the program should be preparing the students so that they're uh, eligible to meet licensure. And then finally, uh, augmentation of formal education experience. I talked about this earlier in the substandards. Um, this is how does the program go beyond just the curriculum itself? And so it includes professional activities, institutional and community service. Uh, students should participate in institutional or college organizations, community initiatives and other co-curricular activities and, and attend and participate in events such as Labash, which you're all here, so you're doing that, great. Uh, ASLA's conference, local ASLA chapters and other activities of professional societies and special interest groups. So how is the program enriching the students' uh, educational experience beyond just the textbooks that they're teaching from? So unfortunately, the revisions process of last spring uh, was coming to a close on May 31st. And we all know that at the same time, the murder of George Floyd and the racial justice protests that followed pushed every institution to look deep within themselves and their work to ensure that they were part of the response and progress towards racial and social justice in the United States. And LAAB was no different. So I'm gonna turn it over to Juanita to talk about some next steps that the board focused on. Thanks, Chris. Um, the board was looking at different ways that they could um, make sure that our standards truly reflected the diversity, equity, and inclusion that that needs to be emphasized in educational programs. And so one of the things we did was to set up a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And you can see uh, Gil Holmes is an attorney. He's one of our private members and the rest of us on the group were um, from various levels of practice. Uh, Ned Crankshaw being an academic practitioner. Next slide. So the first thing that we did um, in order to solicit, solicit additional input to ensure that the standards properly address these issues, LAAB hosted five standards revisions town halls uh, throughout September for the students, faculty, staff, also Black LAN and uh, members of the Diversity Summit and for practitioners. Students learned about the standard revisions and provided, participants actually learned about the standard revisions and provided uh, critical input to LAB. Um, they really talked about some very interesting things and the diversity committee met weekly after that um, 
fall in the throughout the fall to incorporate the responses that we received and to make sure that they were part of the accreditation standard. Rather than just having one DEI standard then, we decided as a committee that the notion of DEI and justice needed to be embedded throughout, next slide, the standards. And so we started off by indicating in program mission and goals, which as Chris told you is the overarching structure of how the program um, is performed, we clarified the language to make sure that the professional programs understood that each one needed to demonstrate through more than just concrete steps, um, the, the uh, co a coherent and long-term efforts to incorporate equity, diversity, inclus and inclusion um, throughout its programs, including, but not limited to recruitment, <clears throat> development and retention of students, faculty and staff, and the curriculum, scholarship and community engagement. The program shall, it goes on to read, um, provide a learning environment that prepares students with a broad range of cultural competencies to navigate a diverse professional world. We felt this was extremely important. This is an overarching context then that should permeate all of the educational experiences that you have. And the assessment that the visiting team would look at then is that the professional program defines its own underrepresented population explains why these groups are of particular interest and importance to the profession and describes the process used to define the underrepresented populations and um, taking into consideration that these are underrepresented populations within the profession. So it gives uh, the each program, because they're located in a different place, the opportunity to focus in on what's going on in their world, so to speak. The second and third um, assessments focus more specifically on what the program is doing. We want them to describe the specific goals that they've come up with for increasing the representation and supporting retention of underrepresented populations among students, faculty, and staff, and the actions and strategies that it's identified to advance those goals. So not only do you need to do this, but you need to define how you're gonna get there and what you're going to do, what the program is going to do to ensure that they are meeting their goals. They need to report on that. Um, and also they need to demonstrate their commitment to advance diversity and cultural competency through a variety of practices, including the development and or implementation of policies that advance and support a, clim a welcoming climate of equity, inclusion, free of harassment, aggressions and discrimination. The context of a welcoming client climate is really, I think, an important thing because people have different experiences and it's important that they're comfortable in the ones that they're working on. I'm sorry, next slide. Um, further to the uh, standard one, we said that um, the program needed to make sure that that we understood, as you understood as a prospective student, even more information about the financial context of going through the program. Um, and this again is an opportunity to reach out to a more diverse population of students. So in addition to the estimated uh, cost of attendance, um, the university needs to provide information about scholarships and assistantships and other financial support options. Um, and also a list of the required and optional materials and equipment and provide an estimated cost. As each of you knows, it's not just the uh, cost of tuition that gets you in there, but then you have to figure out how you're gonna pay for all of the programs that you need to run and the deliverables and equipment that are part of your studio courses. The other thing that we need, the programs need to now report on or estimate the cost of is what would it cost for the experiential learning opportunities? What would um, some programs have a study abroad uh, semester. What does that cost? So that you and your parents or whoever's helping you fund this have a very clear idea of what the financial context is um, so that you're comfortable moving forward in the program because we don't want to lose you at a certain point in time because it becomes financially infeasible. Next slide. In ter terms of student outcomes and experience, this is also getting to the context in which students how they feel 
when they're in the program and also how are they advised and mentored and really importantly most importantly focusing on the fact that individuals have different kinds of needs throughout their careers so this is mentorship from day one throughout your graduation and beyond providing a context for each landscape architect, future landscape architect, to grow comfortably within their own skin and be part of our profession. The assessments then, well, and I guess it's, it's really important to go back one other thing, and that is we wanted to make sure that the students had an idea of the role that, the, that they play as landscape architects in engaging the community, um, the communities around them and the community, the professional community and the changing culture and environment of the, of the profession itself so that they could develop an increased level of competency regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide. So the assessments for this were to evaluate how well those opportunities were being presented. One was that the professional program provides students with opportunities to participate in service learning which incorporates community-based collaboration and engagement and helps to build cultural competence through the educational career. In other words, hopefully you will have some service learning activities where as students, you'll do a project that's part of a community beyond the university. And in that activity, learn how other people feel, learn to listen and to be aware that the experience of other people is not the same, not the same baseline as yours. We also need to understand, LAAV does, that the assessment of the educational structure of the program considers the varied needs and obligations of the students and seeks to overcome barriers to student success. This is communication, this is gender, this is diverse context from which they come, making sure that we are providing a nurturing environment in which the students can grow comfortably. And the students have an opportunity to engage with various aspects of the landscape architecture profession and skills required, hopefully through visiting different offices and learning how the practice is undertaken uh, in public and private practice and in big institutions and other organizations that, that uh, hire landscape architects. Next slide. We wanted to make sure that in terms of the faculty, not only were they um, participating in professional development activities, but they were also participating in professional development associated with diversity, equity, inclusion, and cult cultural competence. I keep having problems saying those two words together. Um, because the faculty needs to be a part of this evolution of ideas as well, and we all need training. We all need to better understand the context in which we need to be practicing. Next slide. So the curriculum assessment committee then began to look more specifically at what was going on in the curriculum itself. And based on the feedback through the revisions process and in reviewing other accreditation standard best practices from related accredited organizations, LAAB established a curriculum assessment committee to develop a rigorous process to validate standard three professional curriculum list and to basically open up the context in which the curriculum is defined. Next slide. Now, as Chris mentioned, um, the current standards, the 2020 standards, under curriculum, they simply list um, the information that is provided on the left-hand side of the slide. So it's very specific and almost a bit prescriptive in some cases in terms of history, theory, philosophy, principles, and values, um, and also the design process and the, the and uh, methodology. What we did was to take those ideas and move them into categories of either knowledge or skills. So in other words, history was <clears throat> within the context of knowledge um, and under that history and theory of landscape architecture, but also in terms of the principles of landscape architecture, there are things associated with resilience and also the legal context of the profession. So you can begin to see how this flow chart shows the transition from a very prescriptive list to the concept of what should you be aware of and what should you know how to do. Next slide. To give you an idea, fleshing out one of those, um, under the knowledge section, let's just read one of them. 
one of the feedback that one of the many things that we heard was that the historical context in which students are educated is in many cases very Eurocentric. And that really is not the world that we live in, um, nor does it really reflect the diverse social and cultural context of our profession, of our communities, and where we will be practicing. So you can see we translated that into students demonstrate an understanding of the histories and theories of the art and science of landscape architecture, because it is both, both sides of your head, in the built and natural environment, in urban community, and ecological planning and design. So this is both for people and the overall um, natural environment. Framed by diverse social, cultural, economic, political, and scientific forces in North America and globally. So this should encourage and help and facilitate a much broader understanding of the history and theory of the landscape and how people from different cultures and communities have had those experiences. Another one under knowledge was uh, plants and that translated into plants, ecosystem and climate science where the students must demonstrate an understanding of the abiotic and biotic aspects of ecosystems associated with both natural and constructed landscapes, and also understand landscape engineering, development, post-construction management, and the impacts that their work, your work as future practitioners would have on the existing landscape and that those interrelationships between ecosystems and climate sciences. And the last one is resilience. And rather than read more and more slides, I wanted to assure you that we really have fleshed out these topics so that I think you will find them to be actually much broader and providing a much um, more robust range of opportunities for learning. Next slide. In addition to taking that list of activities and putting it, or list of focus areas and putting it into skills and knowledge. We also felt that it was really time for the LAAB to define what we believe the core values are and how they might be reflected in the education of future practitioners. And so what we did was to first start out with that preamble of reminding everybody that we are based on two primary principles in the planning, design, and stewardship of the natural and built environments uh, to protect the interests, well being, and safety of people and communities, including generations in the future, and to safeguard the health and resilience of natural systems, ecosystems, and non human inhabitants. So, this is both people, places, and the earth that we live on, and the systems that work. And to that end, we identified that the following core values, the ones that are listed below, we believe are essential to the education of future landscape architects, that the professional programs shall therefore embed into its curriculum, policies, communities, processes, and activities, and identify and engage in contemporary issues in alignment with these values, which I'm just going to go through the headings at this point, but deal with environmental health, sustainability, resilience, and stewardship, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in that one, we describe that landscape architects through their professional undertakings, products, strive to create and maintain an inclusive and welcoming climate, which embraces differences, offers respect in words and actions, displays cultural competence, and values all people and their perspectives as essential for the health and well-being of individuals and communities. I haven't read it all in details, but that gives you a sense of how rich and I think much more broadly we are seeking to define our profession and its values. And the other three deal with human and community health, professional ethics and our responsibilities, and also leadership and innovation, which reads as stewards of our environment and community well-being, landscape architects seek continuous advancement of their own and the discipline's values, knowledge, and skills to practice more effectively, create new ideas and knowledge to affect positive change in the environment, and that we are leaders who inspire, facilitate, and empower innovation. So these are the core values that we are asking programs to embed in their, in the manner in which they teach, and then tell us how they're doing it. Next slide. Um, 
under knowledge, we transitioned from that list of um, items to identifying histories and theories of the art and science of landscape architecture, plants, ecosystems, and climate science, resilience, the legal context of the profession, and professional practice. And just to read a few of, you, of these, under histories and theories of the art and science of landscape architecture, it's more specifically defined here as built in natural environment and urban and community and ecological planning and design framed by the diverse social and cultural, economic and political science forces. So that again, it's a repetition of what you heard before, but after each one of these headings, we have much more specific language. So for resilience, for example, the examples are the social, human, economic and environmental principles of sustainability and resilience landscape performance categories, metrics and methodologies, and the impacts of design within diverse social, human, and economic and environmental systems. Just an example of the kind of fabric that we are sharing um, so that our students are enriched in a much broader range of options. Next slide. In terms of skills and competencies, it's really more challenging, I think, to try and describe a lot of these, um, but we did. We made our best efforts, and when you have an opportunity to review them, we hope that you'll provide us with additional input. These are the things that landscape architects need to be able to do when they graduate. They need to be able to assess, um, analyze the physical, biotic, climatic, and cultural context of a project comprehensive synthesis of objective and subjective analyses, evaluation of the suitability of a program to multiple sites and prioritization, um, and understand how those criteria can be communicated. And the others, in the interest of time, because we're running out of time, um, articulate how design is perceived, the generation of multiple design concepts, communication, the use of verbal, nonverbal, visual, and written communication to clearly and concretely express and solicit ideas. Construction talks about materials and construction techniques, landscape forms and landscape engineering talks about um, grading and the manipulation of land. And we could go on from there, but let's go to the next slide. I think you get a general idea of where we're going here. Under delivery and augmentation, which Chris talked about, we expanded this further so that it now reads that the students shall participate in service learning and interdisciplinary curriculum experiences outside of the profession. And the professional program shall provide opportunities for co-curricular activities, such as institutional and professional activities, internships, off-campus studies, research assistantships, or practicum. We wanted to make it very clear that the concept of co-curricular activities, not what you get from your textbooks and off your computers, is essential to the education, a broader context in which to learn how to practice. And so the assessments uh, include the fact that students are actually participating and the professional program is identifying the objectives and following along with them for service learning projects so that the students can become more aware of the people outside of their programs, that the students are participating in professional programs and that there are interdisciplinary options for those students as well. Um, and the next slide talks about opportunities for students to augment their formal education through Labash, which is what you're doing, but as well as being coming engaged in professional societies, special interest groups, and once again, the program needs to document these activities. And then the fourth one, am I, Chris, next slide? Or is there not a next slide? Oops, sorry. I'm reading on happily here. Um, and then the fourth one is that the students have an opportunity to report. So additionally to their professional curriculum, um, we wanted to clarify research and innovation at the master's level and to make sure that um, the professional program was providing an opportunity for graduate students to develop independent research and or innovative projects to advance the knowledge within the profession and address current and future challenges. And you can see that the assessment tracks that. So that's a very quick, not quick enough perhaps overview. And I do encourage you when we publish these to read it in a little more detail and tell us what we haven't included.
Thank you, Juanita. And use the chat. Let us know if you have any ideas. Uh, you know, we just gave a kind of high level overview, but um, let us know if there could be more that could be included in the accreditation standards as we continue to revise them. And then just to wrap up quickly here. Um, so this last fall and currently this winter, uh, we've continued revising the standards and the board will be adopting re the revisions, the draft revisions. And later this spring, uh, we'll have a comment period. That's similar to stakeholder involvement and feedback process that you probably engaged in some of your projects. So we're looking to all of you as students, uh, our allied partnered organizations like LAF, CLARB, CELA to engage in this, particularly CELA because it affects the faculty the most, particularly students because it affects your education the most, uh, and then others to give us feedback. And once that feedback process wraps up, uh, the board will be adopting those revised standards uh, either later this summer or early fall. And again, plan to publish it by January of next year. So last poll as we close up here. Uh, now that you've learned a little bit more about this, will you engage in this process uh, later this spring to give us your feedback and let us know what you think of how we've done so far in revising the standards? Uh, and if you think we haven't gone far enough or maybe went too far or whatever you think, even if you think it's just good and you like the direction we moved in, we like to hear that as well. And closing the pull out in three, two, one. Uh, so most of you, 88% of you uh, will be engaged. Maybe one of you is graduating and just doesn't care anymore. And that's okay, especially after the year you've had. Uh, so how you can get engaged, review the standards uh, that'll be out for comment, uh, review them, become familiar with them and let us know what you think if you think that we should be expecting more from our programs. Respond to the call for comment that'll be out this spring. Uh, look for revised standards to be published by January of 2022 and see what those final results are. And then again, if LAAB comes, uh, if an accreditation team comes to your program, I hope that you get engaged. Uh, engage with the team, let them know what you think about the program and help uh, your program chair and faculty out in supporting the effort because it's a big deal and a heavy lift. So now I think we'll take it back to Eileen uh, for questions. Yes, thank you, Juanita and Chris, so much for this wonderful talk. I learned so much. Um, attendees, if you have any questions for Chris or Juanita, please use the Q&A feature, not the chat, to ask your question. Additionally, if you see a question that you're really interested in hearing the answer to, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up button that's under the question, and that will bump it higher in the top of the queue so there's a better chance that it gets answered. And it looks like we have a question already. So this question says, hello, I'm a prospective MLA student and have been accepted to programs at home in the US and abroad. I'm wondering why first professional programs here are three years instead of two, as it is in most other countries. As a URM student, I see the length of programs here as a barrier to entry as being in school longer poses a larger financial strain. Are the, are the reasons merely historic or systematic? Yeah, I mean, I, I know that for, uh, for most people, uh, MLA is three years if they don't have any previous experience. I know many programs out there, if you do have previous experience in undergraduate landscape architecture or related de design degree, uh, there's opportunities to shave a year off and have your master's program be two years. Uh, so it really depends on your background, but this is, I mean, it is historic because that uh, has been around for a number of years, but the intention is that everything you have to learn to become a landscape architect um, really takes about three years, uh, you know, with no previous experience uh, to come in fresh and be able to learn everything and, uh, and be able to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public uh, through the work that you do and the engagement and community that you um, work with. Winita, I don't know if there's any additional thoughts about that. I think that's fine, Chris. Um, you know, through the British system, the university programs are structured differently because of what you do between high school and university. But this focuses on exactly what you said. There's just a lot to learn. And it gets bigger every year. So we have we feel the pressure of people not wanting to spend as many years in college at the same time and, and has huge financial impacts at the same time. The 
the baseline of the profession is broadening and it's really important to make sure that your education prepares you for that. And I would just add, um, so it's not just, oh, that's the way it is and we're gonna keep it that way. We do look at it and we looked at it this revision, uh, standards revision process. Um, what we did do, and you'll see in the, in the published standards that came out in January is further define uh, what advanced placement means for master's programs, both undergrad and grad, but particularly we see it most in master's programs so that it could be more consistently fair across master's programs uh, what expectations are if, if a program is going to cut a year off and let someone graduate in two years based on previous education experience. And one tiny little other thing um, that we are thinking about, um, none of this has been defined yet, and that is figuring out ways for um, prospective students to access programs virtually. Because sometimes you have family commitments and other things that need to be taken care of and you can't leave your home um, to come to school programs. So that's just yet another way we're looking at increasing access and making it more cost-effective. Wonderful, thank you both so much. Um, this is perfect timing because I think we'll have just enough time to answer this last question, which is post-graduation, what is the best way to get involved with LAAB as an early career practitioner? That's great. Somebody wants to know about us. We have hope. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Um, well, I'll do another plug uh, that the President's Council groups will be on Thursday, April 22nd, 6 p.m. at Afterbash for a session to talk about how all of the organizations, there's opportunities, and we're actually bringing guest speakers, uh, recent graduates, students, um, and some of our leaders of the different organizations to talk about ways as students and emerging professionals and even uh, senior professionals that have been around for a number of years to engage in the different organizations, specifically for LAAB. Uh, it's as an alumni, when you get those pesky emails or quizzes or surveys from your university asking you about your experience, about how it's going now as a professional, respond to those. Those are important and serious uh, because they need to take that information to continue to improve and enhance the program based on your feedback. And then once you have a number of years of experience under your belt, uh, reach out to us and engage with uh, visiting teams. And you could serve as a, Ro a Rove member, which is one of the evaluators that goes out and conducts the visits. And that's a way to give back uh, to the programs and to the profession to ensure that the university programs out there are um, teaching the students the proper information and, and knowledge and skills so that they could be successful. And one little other additional thing is that on the ASLA website, since ASLA uh, has provided a no cost membership to all of your students, I would encourage you to look at the um, Landscape Architecture Accreditation Board section. And if you have questions or input or ideas, please do not hesitate to, um, I guess Chris will receive them, but send Chris an email and that in turn will be passed on to the board. We really want to hear from you. You guys are the future of our profession and we have a vested interest in your success. So thanks for listening. Marvelous. Well, thank you both so much for this incredible talk. It was so wonderful. To our attendees, thank you all so much for coming and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a wonderful day. I'll end now. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Bye. Have a great day. Bye.